A year ago today, Reverend Sun Myung Moon, founder of the Unification Church, passed away at the age of 92. His death was big news around the world. Leaders from many nations and members of the Unification Church and other faiths all came to Korea to pay their respects. A year later, we take another look at the life of Reverend Moon, his lifelong efforts for peace, and his special concern for the reunification of our homeland of Korea. Here at this convention center in Pyongyang, North Korea, which was built in 2007 with investment from Reverend Moon, a memorial altar was set up after his death for offerings of incense and flowers to his memory. The North Korean Director of Defense, Son Tek Jang, and Labor Party Director, Sing Yang Kyung Kim, were among those who came to offer their respects on behalf of North Korea's Chairman, Kim Jong Un. They also posthumously awarded Reverend Moon, who was represented by his youngest son, with the National Reunification Prize, which has also been awarded to Kim Gu, Wun Hyang Yo, and other prominent Koreans. <laughs> Reverend and Mrs. Moon, who were both born in what is today's North Korea, returned to the country in 1991 to establish a connection of friendship. On December the 6th that year, they arrived in Pyongyang for private talks with President Kim Il-sung. On arrival in North Korea, he met with top leaders of the North at the Mansu Day Congress Hall. Rather than being diplomatic, he gave a bold and controversial speech. Despite Reverend Moon's blunt criticism of his Juche ideology, Kim Il sung welcomed him warmly. At that time, international pressure on North Korea surrounding the nuclear inspection issue was mounting. With matters in Korea in such a state, there was nothing easy or safe about visiting Kim Il-sung at this time. Why did North Korea welcome the visit of Reverend Moon, an outspoken critic of communism? The points agreed upon by Reverend Moon and President Kim included reunions for divided Korean families, international nuclear inspections, cultural exchange, and the development of the Diamond Mountain tourist area. By the time of the North Korean visit, Reverend Moon had been working for a peaceful end to the Cold War hostilities for several decades. After the October Revolution in 1917, Lenin moved quickly to set up an international communist organization. In the late 1920s, the activity of the Chinese Communist Party began to expand to Japan, 
and elsewhere in Asia. Soviet influence also spread, and efforts aimed at the communization of other nations gained momentum. From 1945, the world entered the Cold War era, and Korea suffered the pain of being a divided country. In the 1960s, Reverend Moon started his victory over communism activities in earnest. His first focus was on Japan. He made a determination to transform Cho Chong Young, a Korean organization that was sympathetic to the North. Cho Chong Young was always the king of the North. He was 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 the king of the North. 이 사람들은 이제 한국에 대해서는 적대 감정, 북이 우리를 대하는 감정과 똑같은 감정, 한숨 더 나가가지고 오히려 그냥 이 반동 분야들만 사는 집단이다 대한민국은. The Victory Over Communism campaign began at Chosun University, which was founded and funded by North Korea. Of course, the communists had strong control over all the students, and the work was very difficult. Reverend Moon headed to Japan to lead the campaign in person, and after gathering a base of support, he began to encourage Cho Chong Yong leaders to visit their homeland. 전 일본의 승공 조직을 우선 하고, 그래서 양반이 막온 몸으로 그냥 피땀 흘리면서 129 군데 강연을 이미 했어요 일본에서 막 동서로 남북으로 그리고 나서 이제 조 총년을 일본 사람들을 앞세워서 포섭에다가 미국에 가서 연수한다. 그래 모집해서 가서 거기서 이제 강의 내용은 왜 민주주의가 뭐란가. Reverend Moon's first delegation of North Koreans living in Japan visited Korea in 1974. For most, it was their first visit to their homeland. The success of these campaigns led to the development of a strong base of support in Japan, which helped launch the Victory Over Communism campaign in Korea itself. In 1975, Reverend Moon held a Save the Nation rally on Yoido Island in Seoul. At the time, communization in Indochina was spreading rapidly. The rally recognized the imminent threat to Korea and determined to fight against it. People from many nations came to Korea to spread the news about the rally. It was an unparalleled event for the time. Finally, on the day of the rally, there were more than a thousand participants from 60 different countries, as well as an estimated 1.2 million people from all over Korea. After the success of these Victory Over Communism activities in Asia, Reverend Moon turned his attention to the United States. Following the U.S. defeat in Vietnam, illegal drug use and sexual immorality were causing further turmoil among America's youth. Reverend Moon was very concerned about this problem. On arrival in the United States, this unknown minister from Asia conducted high-profile activities across the country. Americans began to listen to his message that it was time for the United States to wake up. As support for his work grew across the United States, the press and media began to take notice. But if you were under the most enormous effect. In September 1976, in Washington, D.C., hundreds of thousands of people attended a rally in front of the Washington Monument. <laughs> Reverend Moon's 
그리고의 모든 종교인과 온 자유세계인들에게서 심각하고도 절박한 문제입니다. 하나님께서 200년간 준비하신 미국은 크게 각성하고 하나님께서 분부하신 중차대한 세계적 사명을 다하여야 할 것입니다. Huge crowds gathered everywhere. And the rallies had a big impact on American society. The 1976 year-end edition of Newsweek featured Reverend Moon on the cover. He met leading American political figures, spoke on Capitol Hill, and shared his vision for America. He realized that to make a lasting impact, he would need to work with the media. A major initiative was the establishment of the Washington Times, first published in 1982. The Times stood in contrast to the left-leaning journalism of the rival Washington Post and became a central part of Reverend Moon's long battle against communism and left-wing ideologies. Reverend Moon believed that victory for Ronald Reagan, a conservative, was important in order to defeat communism. It wasn't always the popular thing to do, but you were a loud and powerful voice like me, you arrived in Washington at the beginning of the most momentous decade of the century. Together we rolled up our sleeves and got to work. And, oh yes, we won the Cold War. In difficult times, even more than in easy ones, the voice of conservatism must make itself heard in the media. It isn't always easy. It wasn't easy when the paper's founder, Dr. Moon, first began the Washington Times. And I'd be remiss if I did not thank the founder of the Washington Times, Reverend Moon, uh, for his vision in launching this newspaper and others like it. Without him, there would be no Washington Times, and I think it's appropriate that we pay our respects to him. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. With the collapse of communism, Reverend Moon turned his mind to the challenge of reconciliation. He visited the Soviet Union in April 1990. At the time, the Soviet Union did not have diplomatic relationships with South Korea. <laughs> yeah, Reverend Moon held talks with Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev where he offered his firm support for Gorbachev's reform policies of perestroika and glasnost. <laughs> he made several proposals of his own, including the establishment of diplomatic ties with South Korea, economic cooperation, and Russian support for Korean reunification. One bold proposal, which was accepted, was an invitation to sponsor 3,000 university students to visit America on an exchange program. Reverend Moon wanted to introduce these students to new values. A few months before the end of the Soviet Union, an attempted coup d'etat threatened to undo Gorbachev's reforms. But Russian citizens' opposition stopped the coup in just three days. At the forefront, were some of the 3,000 students who had been to the United States. Gorbachev himself was released from house arrest. At last, the Cold War came to an end. A few years later, the Gorbachevs visited Korea and paid a courtesy visit to Reverend and Mrs. Moon at their residence in Seoul. Meeting again after earth-shaking changes, they shared their common vision for peace. In 1994, tensions between North and South Korea were once again running high. There were strong suspicions that the North was developing nuclear weapons. It withdrew from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, triggering the first Korean nuclear crisis. 북한을 향해서 미국은 폭격하겠다고 그랬어요. 또 북한 대표자가 판문점에 나와서 서울 불바다론을 제기하고 그런 전쟁 일부 직전이었거든요. Even though the International Atomic Energy Authority conducted nuclear inspections, they said they needed fuller access to the north. But Pyongyang was strongly opposed. 
North Korean delegate Young Soo Park, visiting Seoul in advance of a planned summit, warned that Seoul could become an inferno. In a situation which could easily have led to war, Reverend Moon increased his Track 2 citizen diplomacy efforts. One such initiative was the North-South Students' Peace Seminar. Meeting in Beijing, China, the students opened a gate for reconciliation between North and South at a time when the two governments were barely speaking to each other. Because it was such a sensitive time, the conference attracted international attention. The students set aside their differences and discussed peaceful roads to unification. They traveled around China together, playing in sports competitions, forging friendships, singing traditional songs, and other cultural programs. After these experiences, the students from North and South became very close. They delivered a statement to their respective countries, saying that it was not necessary to go to war, and what they all wanted was peace and unification. They applied all their youthful energy to dispel the clouds of war. On several other occasions, when the political situation on the Korean Peninsula again became strained, the students' peace seminars offered a way to reduce some of the pressure. After the threat of war had passed, the North and South once again began to work towards the summit meeting. But then Kim Il-sung died, and relations again foundered. The shock enveloped North Korea. <laughs> The funeral procession for Kim Il-sung clearly showed the impact of his death. The people were plunged into very public grief, and Pyongyang was at a standstill. The situation was front-page news in the South as well. No one knew what kind of changes lay ahead. Delegations from many other countries traveled to North Korea to offer their condolences, normal protocol following the death of a head of state. But the South Korean government decided not to send a delegation which the North took as an insult. But Reverend Moon did send a delegation. He asked Bo Hee Park, then president of the Sege Times newspaper, to attend the funeral on his behalf. With government permission, Dr. Park made his personal, unofficial trip to Pyongyang. He met with Kim Il-sung's son, Kim Jong-il, to offer Reverend Moon's condolences. However, Dr. Park's visit was strongly criticized by the South Korean press. Intimidated by this reaction, the government reversed its original position. The visit was recategorized as being unpatriotic, and it was announced that Dr. Park would be punished in accordance with national security laws. After that, he could not enter Korea for four years. <laughs> Despite the repeated lack of official cooperation, Reverend Moon continued his outreach to the North and moved forward to establish cultural ties. The Little Angels, a children's troupe which had been performing around the world since its founding by Reverend Moon in 1963, made a special 10-day tour to North Korea in May 1998. They were the first cultural visitors from the South to visit the North since the division of the country. People thronged to the theater to see these young ambassadors for peace. The emotional welcome for the Little Angels from the South was truly historic, and this was the work of Sun Myung Moon. 하루속히 우리 조국이 통일이 되어 여러분과 더 자주 만날 수 있는 날이 오기를 바랍니다. 
우리나라 전통 무용인데 뭐 화감무, 처녀총각, 뭐, 뭐 꼭두각시, 부채춤, 뭐 북춤 이런 식으로 It was more than just a dance performance. It was the opening of a new road to unification. 북한과 남한과 그 문화를 교류할 수 있었다는 것에 음, 굉장히 기여가 컸던 것 같아요. Then in the summer of 2000, Reverend Moon invited a student dance troupe from Pyongyang to visit Seoul. Again, they were the first civilian group from the north to visit the South since the division of Korea. History was being made again in a hopeful spirit of reconciliation and dialogue. The goal of initiating cultural exchange, agreed to ten years earlier by Reverend Moon and Kim Il-sung, was at last accomplished. It was a major milestone in the limited history of North-South cultural relations. After the successful performance, people were visibly moved. Many started to believe that it might be possible to achieve unity between the North and South after so long a separation. 일반 주민들의 인식을 바꾸는 데 상당히 기여했을 겁니다. 이거 같은 이제 동포애를 느끼고 민족 동질성을 느끼고 그러면 이제 정치적으로도 같이 화해해 나가야 된다는 오늘 남과 북은 이렇게 민족을 향해 또전 세계를 향해 남북한의 정상이 평양에서 만나기로 했다고 알렸습니다. It was the first summit between the North and South in the 55 years since the division of Korea in 1945. The summit resulted in the signing of a joint declaration between North and South, which included reunions for families divided by the partition of Korea, civilian exchanges, economic cooperation, and the opening of the Diamond Mountain Resort area. Efforts were also made to bring about normalization of North Korean relations with the United States and Japan. The first face-to-face -face talks between the heads of the two countries since the division of the Korean Peninsula was a historic occasion. After the summit, official economic ventures began. However, Reverend Moon had launched such economic cooperation years before. One important initiative was the establishment of Pyeongwa Peace Motors. The creation of an automobile factory provided opportunities for technological development and the chance to strengthen North Korea's weak economy. Kim Jong-il and other top North Korean leaders eagerly welcomed the opening of the factory in 1998. Among the many areas that Reverend Moon has worked on in his lifetime, Working for the harmony of religions, youth education, women's rights, and ending poverty are among the most important. As a religious leader, Reverend Moon was very aware of the problem of religious disunity. Conflicts with religious roots are still taking place in many parts of the world. Reverend Moon's interfaith programs have helped religions to work for peace as one family under God. On September 11, 2001, the World Trade Center in New York was destroyed by Islamic suicide terrorists. 
where the Moon has emphasized that interreligious cooperation was essential to solve this issue. He gathered the faithful from every religion to lead the way to break down barriers of mistrust and misunderstanding. 미국에서 닦아진 그런 모든 세계적 기반을 어, 중동적으로 포커스를 하시면서 비정치적, 비군사적 입장에서 민간 차원의 강력한 NGO 운동으로 어, 중동의 분위기를 바꿔 나가야 된다. At the height of the second intifada between September 2003 and May 2004, religious leaders from every tradition gathered to try to end the violence. 전 세계에서 약한 3천 명 정도의 평화를 사랑하는 사람들을 초종교적으로, 초국가적으로 어, 예루살렘에 가서 평화 운동을 어, 하도록 하라. 정상들만 해도 한 60명 정도가 참여할 정도였으니까 어, 이스라엘 팔레스타인 역사에 가장 큰 규모의 어, 외국 사절단이 한꺼번에 들어온 거죠. Out of the whole governmental activities, the UPF are making the most important activity for the peace in the Middle East. Reverend Moon had long viewed the conflict between religions as one of humanity's most serious problems. In 1985, he started the Assemblies of the World's Religions and developed this initiative throughout the world. He believed religious leaders should meet in person to overcome their differences and agree on a path that all religions could follow together. In Geneva in 1985, the Professor's World Peace Academy was the first academic body in the world to predict the imminent fall of the Soviet Empire, a bold claim that attracted the attention of scholars the world over. 국경에 갇혀 있지 않고 국제적인 차원에서 자기 전공을 뛰어넘어서 학제적으로 학문의 영역을 뛰어넘어 다른 학문의 영역에 있는 사람들까지 손을 잡고 공통 목표인 세계 인류의 평화를 논할 수 있는 그런 그 어, 자리를 만들어 줘야 되겠다. 이런 생각을 하신 거죠. Reverend Moon wanted to provide an open interdisciplinary forum and said that scholars had a duty to help solve real-world problems and promote world peace through joint research and cooperation. A number of Nobel laureates have joined these academic conferences hosted around the world. Reverend and Mrs. Moon have supported various projects for relief and development. In 1975, they established the International Relief Friendship Foundation to provide food, medical supplies and other necessities to poor countries in Africa, South America and elsewhere. The foundation continues to support mobile medical teams, technical education, water purification and other projects and runs several schools in Africa. Encouraged by the range of these activities, President Goodluck Jonathan invited Reverend and Mrs. Moon as state guests to Nigeria in 2011. Reverend and Mrs. Moon have long been involved in women's empowerment as well. In 1992, they founded the Women's Federation for World Peace as a way to give women a greater voice in peacemaking. Women participated in Bridge of Peace reconciliation ceremonies between Japan and America, China and Japan, and other former enemy nations. Projects like these continue in every region of the world and are striving to establish a new standard for women's empowerment. As the position of women gains prominence and the Women's Federation's efforts to enhance world peace become better known, it has gained recognition from many prominent world figures, including UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. The activity of Reverend Moon is a very important. Why I consider it important? Because start of the inception of the United Nations. By any standards, the worldwide impact of Reverend Moon's life and work is remarkable. He is remembered by many as a pioneer, tearing down the walls of division for the sake of reconciliation and unity. Whether publicly recognized or not, his trailblazing engagement with North Korea has contributed to the process of unification. He has left behind a great legacy, but there are many things to be accomplished to realize his vision of one family under God.